Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. My name is Susan Coots. I'm a veterinarian at the University of Calgary in the Department of Ecosystem and Public Health. Uh, these last two talks have been wonderful for setting up my talk, so I thank you both, or all three of you, for, for the um, talks that you gave um, regarding monitoring and Indigenous knowledge. So I'll just start, uh, somebody said yesterday that, you, that um, if, if I can see far, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And um, I want to first acknowledge over the last 25 years, the many, many Indigenous people in the Canadian North who have been part of my education. Um, and in particular, in the last few years, communities of the Satu, Ekaloktutuk, Koloktuk, and Ulohokto, um, where people have really guided me and my graduate students through understanding wildlife health in the North. I also want to thank all the trainees, the graduate students, postdocs, technicians that are part of my group. Um, everything I present today is in some way a product of, of their work. Um, so, and they're a great group. <laughs> all right. Um, so I guess that the issue that we're dealing with today is about pathogens potentially um, thawing out of permafrost, glaciers, ice patches, graves. And what I want to address is the importance of wildlife in this story and that wildlife are the first, maybe the first to be affected by these things. They're important sentinels of what's going on out there. They're also important amplifying hosts. So if infected, they may amplify these pathogens in the environment. And as was addressed in the last talk, they're definitely a food safety concern for Indigenous people who depend on them. And I think this image here taken on Banks Island several years ago with this big slump, um, Iceland and slump and the permafrost people can really tell us what's happening here. But you see the animals are all around here. They're exposed to whatever's coming out of these, these thaws. The problem we have, and which has been addressed throughout the, the meeting, has been that the wildlife health surveillance in the Arctic is often not sensitive or effective. Um, we've seen some different models of what's happening and what could happen, but really we're not quite there. It's not like being in the south where we can hop you know, get onto things quickly and figure out what's going on. We have these issues around population densities. So Michael showed another figure. Um, essentially, you know, there's not many people up here. We have a little dot here, here, here. Um, if we, um, this is the area that I work in for the most part. Cambridge Bay is 1,500 people. Kukluktuk about 1,500. Ulohokto less than 500. Saks Harbor, I think maybe 100 or so. So there's not a large population, big distances between, no roads, um, airplane is really the main ro route of transport. So what we end up with is that surveillance is hampered by um, lack of local expertise, fear of um, what these sick animals may have, costs and logistics, shipping of samples was addressed in the last talk, <laughs> um, time delays and sample quality are, are compromised, unknown and existing Unknown existing pathogen diversity, which was addressed yesterday um, uh, globally, is we just don't have a good idea of what's really out there. And then also in some of these northern territories, we don't have policies. We don't have reportable diseases on a territorial level or political will, and there's a lot of other priorities. So this means that um, wildlife health surveillance is not always a top priority. So what this also means is instead of getting something like this to do a post-mortem on, you often end up with this. Um, and it also means that we have a lot of unexplained mortalities and diseases happening across the north, um, stolen from the LEO network. Um, so this is an article that, uh, actually this was before, uh, this wasn't LEO network at this time, this is 2011, mysterious outbreak killing diseases across the Arctic. Um, now, Cheryl may correct me, but to the best of my knowledge and from what I can tell, we still don't know what has caused that, but this is stolen from the Leo Wet Network. Um, we're into a new outbreak and not knowing what's causing them. Uh, last, a couple of years ago, we had thousands of dead geese on the shores of Cambridge Bay. Um, still, really, we had a few samples submitted, no good diagnoses. And I could go on and on and on with different outbreaks that we really don't know what's going on. So we need a solution to this, and uh, we believe that bringing knowledge systems together can help wildlife health surveillance. And this is an area that our group has been working in more and more um, and trying to figure out how we can bring the different knowledge systems together to really be effective at wildlife health surveillance. 
This has also been addressed in a broader sense um, by the UN in a report that was put out in 2019. It says the complexity that we're dealing with in the Arctic um, requires that we draw on all knowledge sources. So adaptation that integrates and respects local knowledge and indigenous knowledge will be vital to help Arctic societies address coming challenges. So from the perspective of wildlife health, um, and if we think about indigenous knowledge, this is a knowledge that's accumulated over generations. It's a knowledge that crosses all seasons. So while the biologist may be up there at a specific time of the year, the indigenous people are out there on the land at all times. It's a knowledge about what's normal and abnormal that's gained through, um, through butchering numerous animals over a lifetime. And it's a knowledge that also goes across many species. This is just a figure showing work by uh, my grad student, Matilda Tomaselli in Ekolok Tutiak, and it shows you the diversity of country foods people are eating. So they really are this first point of surveillance. And our challenge <laughs> is on the roof, um, <laughs> is to ensure that the knowledge and experience, this knowledge and experience is respected, documented, and implemented. So what I'm going to do now is just go over some of the work that our group has been doing on muskox and caribou health research. Um, and I'll just touch on a few things in it. I can't go comprehensively in it. And I'll focus on this incredibly beautiful and charismatic animal, the muskox. <laughs> so the work that we're doing now was initiated really in 2008 when this um, lungworm named Umingmuk strongulus palicucensis. Um, this is actually the first nematode ever named in an indigenous North American language. Umingmuk means muskox in Inyonaktun, and Palakuk was the region that the uh, <coughs> parasite was first found in. So um, <laughs> all parasitologists since have hated us for this, but, <laughs> 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 but it's an elite group that can say the name. Um, anyway, this parasite used to be restricted. It's a muskox lungworm, used to be restricted on the mainland. Um, I finished my PhD thesis in the late 90s. I said this is temperature dependent under current climate change scenarios. It's going to expand its range. And then in 2008, we found it had expanded its range. Sad to have these predictions occur in your lifetime, um, but in fact it did. Um, the parasite is one that is temperature dependent. Uh, larvae are shed in the feces, they go into slugs and snails. Temperature, um, the development is temperature dependent. Muskox eat slugs and snails, so they get the lungworm. So with the movement of this parasite onto the island, um, further north into an area that was quite a bit, had historically been quite a bit cooler, it told us that environmental conditions were changing. This is a big lungworm, it's charismatic, I cared about it, we were looking for it, but it made us think what else might be going on there, we should be a little bit more alert about this. Um, just uh, the parasites now made it up to the far end of the island. Um, so because of this, we started to work at the time, there was a uh, commercial harvest of musk oxen happening out of Ekaluk Tutiak, also known as Cambridge Bay. So we said, well, let's test these animals that are being harvested. And so we did for a couple of years, and we found nothing really interesting. They were sort of healthy from what we could tell. Um, but then in 2009, there was a report of three dead musk oxen just on the tundra, um, and that was reported by people from Ulahukto. 2010, and, and nothing really happened with that because of distance, um, quality of samples, etc. 2010, I got a call that the Hunter and Trappers organization had been doing a sport hunt and found 10 dead musk oxen up near Wellington Bay. They reported it two weeks after they'd seen the animals. It took a week till I could get up there. We went into the field, we got some samples, we tested for things that we knew about and um, really didn't get anything much out of it. <coughs> The next year we went looking for the lungworm over here and found three more animals, took samples. Um, the samples weren't in great shape. We archived them and went, you know, we need to figure out what's going on here. It's only three animals, no big deal. 2012, Banks Island reported some dead animals. They had an airplane in the area. They could go out, do a little bit of a reconnaissance and they found hundreds of dead animals. And then, ah. 2013, I was up here on the north end of the island and found some carcasses. Um, at this point in time, actually in 2012, we were able to get good samples from an animal that had just died. It was determined that it was, um, as the animals had died from a septicemia caused by the bacteria Erysipelothrix ruciopathy. Um, and this 
was later, we went back to our archived samples and we were able to pull that out of every animal that we had sampled. Um, this is a zoonotic bacteria. It's a generalist opportunist that you can find in any warm-blooded animal as well as on fish slime. Um, once we found out what it was, there was some public health messaging that was done by the territorial governments. We did subsequently do whole genome sequencing of this and it was very interesting. Um, and just really briefly, so this is erysipelothrix. It's broken down into three clades. All of this pink one is the one that we got out of musk oxen across this area, which was 300,000 square kilometers. There was no difference in this strain across all those animals, which I can't talk about now, but I'd love to talk to people about this further later. Um, all these other ones were, there was about 100 different strains we'd gotten from wildlife, domestic animals, etc., and they were, they're all sitting around in here. But we had this unique strain that has caused this die-off. Um, we also did, there was a human infection that happened in one of the communities um, on these islands, and we were able to get that ice, sequence it, and find out that it actually wasn't from the, it wasn't the muskox strain, so we don't know the source of it. Um, so anyway, this all led us to say, you know, things are not quite right. We need to start to monitor muskoxen up there, and we thought we would do it through what we call a community-based wildlife health surveillance approach. And to do that, um, we had sort of a couple different things going on. This is Matilda. She did inter individual interviews with people in Ekluktutjuk, and then that led into group interviews. Um, we started a hunter-based sampling program so that people could take samples from the animals they were hunting anyway. And then from this, we also derived um, some scientific sample collection and studies that were informed by the community-based wildlife health surveillance. Um, I just want to mention briefly, because I, I don't have time to talk much more, but all of this program, fundamental to it, was building capacity in the communities. So this is monitor training. There's a monitor in the community who works with the hunters to make sure the kits are filled out and do the data collection. Um, we go into the classroom with this science. These kids are dissecting muskox lungs and looking at umming muskostrongulus. Um, engage community members, including wildlife officers, and, and hold a, a disease workshop with the community members to help them learn how to protect themselves because they are the people on the ground collecting samples. So how do they protect themselves from getting sick? Um, the interviews that were done were first individual semi-structured interviews um, and then small group interviews. We were asking about muskoxen. People told us about caribou. <laughs> Um, I won't present the caribou results, but I, it became very clear that this was the priority. Uh, caribou was really a, a higher priority, um, and so we, we did follow up with that and gather data on that as well. Um, the small group interviews, we really used a participatory epidemiology approach with different mapping exercises, drawing exercises, uh, beans for proportional piling, and timelines. And then when all of these results came in and we analyzed them and looked at them, we went back to the communities and said, this is what we heard, is this correct? We didn't just walk off and publish it. So I'll go through some of these results. Um, the first thing that Matilda did is just find out what's the area of observation people are looking at. So what, where are our observations coming from? She had the resident hunters, and this is a, Ekaluktutjaks in here, so a fairly big hunting range, and then some sporadic places, and then the pilots. And there were a couple pilots that had flown this area for about 20 years. So we incorporated that local knowledge into the study as well. One of the key things she did with her group interviews is she asked people to draw in their lifetime the dynamics of the muskox population. She said, okay, pick the point in time when you think they were at the peak and then tell me what happened around that. And this is what people ended up drawing. So each of these symbols represents a different group. These are the groups. Um, these are their observations. And this is your best fit line going through there. And so people told us, you know, in the past, there were very, very few muskoxen. Then they increased, and they've done this dramatic decline. We happen to, Canada doesn't have a lot of money, which means we do aerial surveys once every decade, unlike the Alaskans who do them every year. Um, but we're not jealous. Um, <laughs> but it just happened that we did do aerial surveys this year, and these observations actually were very consistent with what was seen on the aerial surveys, which we don't compare traditional knowledge to scientific knowledge, but it's sure nice when they are, are saying the same thing. It provides more confidence. So there'd been a pretty dramatic decline. 
We then went and looked at that timeline and said, well, what's happened there? What else can we gain as far as understanding this system? And so Matilda said, okay, there's this time period of pre-declining and then this declining period. Tell us about the animals then. And to do this, she used a series of proportional piling exercises. So she calls it the beans, the beans exercises, but essentially a pile of beans, some questions here. This one is pictures of diseases that people saw. Um, how commonly is, do you see this, 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 and this? Take the proportions of those beans and you actually measure, get numbers out of it um, that you can present to scientists who then go, oh, this is, I, can, I know how to use this. Um, so what did we find from that? And I'll just present a few things here. One is that in the de pre-decline period, the proportion of juvenile animals was up at about 30%. In the decline period, it had declined itself. So there are fewer juveniles out there, which makes sense in a population. Then we asked a number of other things. One was body condition. So animals had <coughs> declined in body condition. Pre-decline, they were mostly all fa excellent and good. Post-decline, they're in fairly good, poor in good condition. Health status, in the past, most of them were healthy up here. Um, in the post-decline or the decline period, this, there's more variability around whether they're healthy, but we see that there's a lot more dead happening. And then cause of death became quite interesting. So pre-decline, cause of death was thought to be predation, predation, predation. Um, during the decline, cause of death, predation got a whole lot of variability in observations, which again, this variability is quite interesting. Um, but acute death showed up there as quite a significant cause. So we explored this acute death a little bit further and um, asked people more about it. And so the area of observation we're dealing with is just the area, immediate area where people were hunting. Now you'll remember on that first figure I showed you, we had see, we'd heard about 10 dead musk oxen in 2010. When Matilda sat down and talked to people and said, what have you been seeing? Um, they said, yeah, we saw dead animals in 2010. We also saw them in 2009, 11, 12, 13, 14. As scientists, we missed this epidemic curve entirely. We did not know that was happening. So when we think we can actually track emerging disease in the Arctic, I think this is a really good example of how we're not doing a very good job of it yet. And it's not, you know, it's nobody's fault. It's an issue of logistics and challenges. But it also shows you that there's a tremendous amount of information out there. We just need to gather it properly. Um, in addition to the mortalities, people, we got a lot more epidemiolo epidemiological data out of this. So this is the area of observation. So there is the, the pilots and the hunters. This is representing the mortalities over time from 2009 to 14, and the size of the circle is the, nu is the number of mortalities. Um, and then this is a seasonality of observed cases. So we see that really this was happening primarily in the spring and the summer. So a ton of really important information that we were not getting, despite the fact we had an active monitoring program happening um, until we talked to people. So the other piece of the program that we do is a hunter-based sampling program. And um, we essentially provide hunters with kits to collect samples. Um, and we've designed these kits and the samples that are being collected to gather important information on indicators of health that can be done consistently and over time. Um, we have a data sheet that goes with that. And so they go out, they collect samples. Uh, the main samples are blood on filter paper that we can do all sorts of serology with a bone to do body size, um, parasites, bone marrow fat, feces, and then hair, um, skin with hair, and we look at stress and trace minerals. So what do we find from that? Well, in the interviews, local and indigenous knowledge had told us that in, over time, um, they'd seen animals that are skinnier, scabs on the mouth, overgrown hooves, tooth abnormalities, fewer calves, and limping. When we looked at the results from our hunter sampling, we had animals reported to be very skinny. Musk oxen are meant to be super fat. There should be like inches or centimeters of fat on this animal and there's nothing. Um, this is abnormal. Scabs on the nose. So this is a muzzle of a musk ox and you can see all these little scabs or plaques. This is a pox virus, parapox virus, or um, there was some local knowledge of it. It had never been isolated previously. We've isolated it. It's, it seems to be probably has been with musk oxen for a long time, but again, didn't know anything about it, probably zoonotic. 
um, abnormal hooves, broken teeth, these are the incisors of a muskox. Um, and then also we had um, bones with these funny abscesses in them and then just unusual abscesses. People, there's in the kit, there's um, a bag for abnormalities. People would submit abnormalities. Um, and sometimes they were just abscesses that we then went and cultured. And from this and from some of these abscesses, we cultured brucella. Um, very unusual presentation for this. Brucella does circulate in caribou around the north, but in muskox, and it had not been reported that much. So Matilda looked at this, she looked at these observations, and she said, I wonder what's going on with bru brucella, um, which can cause limping, it can cause um, abortions or infertility. So she went to archive data from muskoxen, um, from Saks Harbor, Ulu, Kolotok, and Cambridge Bay, and said, and then looked at our current data, and she found, okay, nothing's been happening on Banks Island. There's no brucella circulating in muskoxen. Around Uluhukto, I will just go down to Kugluktuk. Um, in the past, they didn't see it. Today, we don't see it. And these are all from our hunter kits, uh, the recent samples. But on Victoria Island in Uluhukto, there was nothing in the past. Um, in the, this serology, so the, this blood strips were tested for brucella. We had one of 37. We just got results back from 2019 and um, from that we had a 15 percent prevalence out of 40 samples. So this has changed dramatically. Um, around Cambridge Bay again in the past that there's five animals out of 500. Now we, we get quite a bit more. So it seems that this is an emerging condition first identified by us listening to the local people about syndromes and also by collecting samples that we could test. Um, so what does this all matter? First and foremost, it matters for the animals. We tend to always say, well, what about us? What about us? These guys are pretty important. They're unique. They're part of the Arctic ecosystem. When you talk to indigenous people, they talk about if we take care of the animals, they'll take care of us. So first and foremost, we have a moral obligation to take care of these guys. Secondly, um, they are sentinels of change. So again, they, they may be the first exposed to changing conditions. Um, they are also potential reservoirs and amplifying hosts for emerging diseases. Um, we know that indig indigenous people have a very intimate connection with wildlife and that because of that, anything happening in the animals is going to influence them and so again, coming back to the indigenous knowledge and the importance of that, this gives us a contextual understanding based on experiential knowledge and knowledge that's been passed down over generations on a temporal and spatial scale that cannot be accomplished with Western science. We can do a lot with Western science, but this we cannot do. It informs and generates research hypotheses that we can follow up on and at the same time, with our scientific findings, as those go back into the community, it generates new knowledge or um, brings ob existing observations up to the forefront that can inform that. And it's also probably our best way to detect change early in the Arctic. Um, so just to conclude on this, effective wildlife health surveillance requires bridging these different knowledge systems. With this, I've shown you how indigenous knowledge can bring a lot of information. It can detect diseases. Um, it, can, it can tell us about the epidemiology. The hunter-based sampling gives us physical specimens we can take to the lab. We can test them. We can bring that back. And it also, together, these things generate hypotheses of what might be going on in the system that we can follow up on. And then ultimately, of course, this can all feed into public health messaging and hopefully some type of management. Finally, the cautionary note that Cheryl also ended on is this, is, this was in a paper many years ago, but it highlights the importance of how we communicate these things that we think are really important. And this was an article about the government scientists swooping in, um, bearing a warning that the wild, wild birds that the Yupik have hunted for millennium may be carrying the first traces of deadly bird flu virus. Um, and this was a quote from a, a fellow that was in that community. Um, most of us in this room are thinking about infectious disease or permafrost. We see a lot of, you know, we're waving our hands and we're worried about things and there's reasons to, to do that. But again, the way we communicate these things, the way we approach communities is just uh, really critical and I think we all need to be sensitive to it. 
So with that, I'll finish up, and I don't know if there's any time for questions. I'm wondering, so like in Africa, there's been research done where, you know, bushmeat hunters are basically trained to take their own blood sample out of filter paper and a sample from the animals that they're hunting. Has anything been tried in communities like this that would allow some sort of surveillance to happen on a... Of human so surveillance, like people. Well, so we are we are using the filter paper, and like we are doing the animal surveillance. Yes. So, and, and in these three communities, primarily, um, we've had the program going for three to five years, depending on where you are. So that, so what we try to do, and have been actually quite successful, is to get. 30 to 50 hunted animals per year that we do this standardized testing. And I could show you the figures of what's happening over time. With respect to the human sampling, that all has to go over to public health um, and, and working with public health. Yeah. Fantastic talk, great work, congratulations. Thank you. Um, you mentioned caribou. Do you see something similar in the caribou population? Yeah, well? yeah. So, so the difference, um, the, the population trends, many of these things are the same. The difference that we saw between the caribou and musk oxen is caribou people are observing a lot more sick caribou, and not so many dead ones, and and that may be a, an observation bias. Musk oxen are bigger; they don't disappear from the tundra as easily, um, whereas caribou are smaller, and within a few days they'll disappear, whether they drop dead or or that. But, but they um, definitely, looking at specific diseases over time, they identified several that had increased and some new disease syndromes. Yeah. Um, that last slide you showed about the importance of communication, I wasn't sure if you were saying that the nature of the communication in that case was adequate or alarmist. I, I think in that case it was alarmist. Um, unintentionally alarmist, but I think it, it was. Um, How could it have been better? Um, I suppose it's important to know what's going on at the community level and how this has been communicated to the people in the community before it's happened, number one. Because people should never, in a community, should never hear about what's happening in their community about an animal disease through the press. It should be coming first through whoever their local contact is, the biologist, the public health, whatever it may be. Um, once that's done, then I think the communication needs to be balanced. Um, our headlines can be horrendous. Uh, killer cat parasite in beluga causes <laughs> abortion. You open up your paper and look at that. Um, so I think, you know, those are the pieces that need to be looked at. Yeah. You, you, you talked about arterial <laughs> blood disease. Is, is that associated with new pathogens coming in from the south? Do you uh, think, or is it a general weakening of, I, the, of the animals making them more susceptible to yeah. microbes that are already present? Yeah, so I don't know Warwick. This, this air cyclotrix is a real puzzle um, because we had two hypotheses. One, this has just appeared and is highly pathogenic and, and it's wiping them out and you know, rapidly spreading. The other one is it's always been around and the animals are they're increasingly stressed. Initially, when we had our little 10 animals, we looked at weather data and we said, oh, look, it was really warm before this outbreak. Well, it ends up being useless when you don't know that the next year there was even a bigger outbreak and you're not comparing it. Um, our whole genome sequencing tells us that from every animal that died acutely, there's one strain. From one animal, there was a second strain, but that animal also had the first outbreak strain. And it's, I mean, it's nearly identical across that massive area, which suggests a new introduction. Although it's a landscape of low diversity, so perhaps we should think the bacteria also have a low diversity. When we look back serologically, we do see some reactors to erysipelothrix in the early 90s. But that could have been percolating along too. Um, at the same time, you know, I, I could go into the, the, the fact I call these musk oxen on Victoria Island, they're just poor health. You know, they're skinny, they're dying, they've all got all sorts of different infections now. It seems like they had this big thing came through, knocked them down, but they're just not doing well. There's mineral deficiencies, there's all sorts of things. So, so it seems like there's a real double whammy. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Plus. 
And musk oxen have less, they have less genetic diversity than a cheetah. So they're not well equipped for a changing environment. Okay, well, I have to stop you, otherwise we are running completely out of time. So thank you very much. Thank you.